Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is time to begin. We are beginning a study this morning of the book of Acts, part two, and it's a delight to be with you today to begin that. The, the college age, early 20s, late teens, early 20s class is going, is starting this morning as well, back on A7 with David and I believe who else is in there with him? And Gerald Bard. Gerald Bard and David Lanfair are teaching that class. So that's available if any of you were not aware of that. That's beginning today. It's good to be here with you. There was a little bit of concern this morning and, and or earlier this week. And even earlier than that, some had been exposed to and had the virus. And so there was concern about that. And the elders acted quickly to cancel uh, service Wednesday night. Just get you a note of what the class is about. That... <clears throat> And they acted quickly to cancel classes, uh, service Wednesday night, and they also acted quickly to come back to in-person service this morning. So we're in person, and we're also in uh, online as well, live. And so if you're participating online, thanks for, for watching and, and pay attention to the class. And this is the beginning of the study of the book of Acts, part two. It's hard to believe this is the fourth quarter of 2020. Back in January, my cousin spoke at a lectureship in Dallas, Texas, and he asked a question to kind of a couple of questions to get a different perspective or show the different perspective between young and old. And he said, first of all, how many of you cannot who thought 2020 would never get here? And all the young people raised their hands. Then he flipped the question, how many of you can't believe that it's already 2020? And all the older folks raised their hand. I downloaded and listened to that in April in the middle of the shutdown. And I texted him and I said, cousin, the question now is, how many of you believe 2020 will never end? (laughs) And it still feels that way. Six months later, it still feels that way. But it will. It will end. 2021 will be here in just a few months. And hopefully we'll return to multiple adult classes, not just the two, but back to the four that you normally had for so long and be able to get back to that. And we're going to continue our study of Acts chapter 2. But let's begin with a prayer at this time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather with your saints, with your people, the ones that you called out of the world, out of the darkness of this world, into the light of your gospel and into you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to study the work that you did through your apostles and, and believers in the first century. And may we continue their work here in the 20th and 21st century and beyond. Thank you so much for forgiveness that's available in Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right. Now, what we want to do this morning is just, it's going to be a review. We're going to review 14 chapters, and rather than just go chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, I want to pull a theme out of all of that and kind of pull it all together with one particular theme. There are a number of different things we could look at, but I picked just one that will help us pull this together. And we're going to start with this idea of thinking today of being in a mall or on a roadside rest stop, and you stop and you look at the map and it says, you are here. Now, if you weren't driving, or if you're not navigating through the mall, you may be wondering, how did we get here? And that's our question this morning. How did we get here? And we're going to use that question for our study. In a similar sense to being in the mall or on the roadside stop is being in this class this morning. If you weren't in the the class that Mike and LR taught back in the spring, you may wonder, well, how do we get to Acts chapter 15? How do we get to the middle of the book of Acts? And the question, how do we get here, is a great question, not just for this class, but for Christians in general. And we're going to see that the book of Acts has answers to this question that are very, very important answers. And hopefully by the time we get through with class today, you won't feel like these two critters and wonder, how did I get here? Uh, Well, hopefully we'll work our way through this and you won't think, is this ever going to end? Well, it'll end. We'll get through this and we're going to go through it very quickly. I asked Matt not to mess with the microphones because it's a review and we're going to be going fast. And if I have any questions, and I do have some questions, I sent those out, I put them on the Facebook page last night or yesterday, and hopefully you, some of you got that, I know, and hopefully you'll uh, be able to answer that. And if you have a question or an answer to the, one of the questions we, we ask, just shout it out, and I'll repeat it and make sure that uh, everyone hears the answer. 
Well, the easy answer to how we got here in Acts chapter 15 is that back in the spring, Mike Thomas and L.R. Kennan taught the class. But if you recall, that was when the virus exploded and everybody got shut down. And all of a sudden, instead of being in a classroom together, we were trying to do this online. Some of it pre-recorded, some of it live. And it was just kind of awkward. I was in a class also with uh, Carol Duckworth, and it was a little difficult, a little awkward, but we pressed on. We kept trying. And so that's how we got here. There was a first, I think, for all of us to go through that kind of process. And since it was the one of four classes that time, uh, most of you in here probably were not in that class. But if you weren't, know this, the, the material is available. Those classes are recorded and available on YouTube, and I want to go through quickly and show you how to find it. If you've never been on YouTube, this is open on the Internet. It's not like having to be a member of Facebook. YouTube is an open page, and so you can go there, and you, all you got to do is look for West End Church of Christ. Put in Bowling Green, because there are a number of West End Churches, Church of Christ out there. Put in Bowling Green, and then when you get there, go down to find it. Go to Playlists. Look on the playlist, and when you go to the playlist, look down for the book of Acts, class 2020, and then click on View All, View Full Playlist, and then you can work your way through that. I would recommend you do that. It's available, it's out there, and I just want to show you how to find that so that if you were not in that class, you can watch those as a supplement to the material that Mike and I will be covering this quarter. Now, that's the easy answer. That's the easy answer. But I grew up prior to texting, I am, and Twitter, so as far as I'm concerned, if the easy answer is good or the short answer is good, the long answer is better. And so we're going to spend our time this morning looking at the long answer to how did we get here. And when I say that, I have three things in mind. The first thing is, how did you come to be a believer or become a believer in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and end up here as a member of the West End Church of Christ? Now, this is not designed to make you give specific details about what happened or, or your, into your, give us information into your background. When Jim Whiteside and I taught the class on personal evangelism back in January, we did ask that question to get some background information. But this is more of a broader perspective because I'm wanting you to think about the theme that's going to pull us through this whole class today and through the book of Acts when you really get down to it. Second question is, how did the West End Church of Christ come into existence? How did it get to be, not specifically here in this building, but how did it come into existence? The answer to that also is in the book of Acts. The answer to question number one is in the book of Acts. The answer to this question is in the book of Acts. And the third question is, how did the Lord's church come into existence? And we're kind of working our way backwards from here and now to the beginning in the book of Acts. All the answers to these questions are in the book of Acts. Now, before we get into those questions and start answering those questions, we need to ask this question or kind of set some basic principles. First basic principle is that the book is a second half of a two-book set. And these are, this, is, uh, this was a question that was asked in the questions that I sent out on Facebook page yesterday. How do we know this was the second half of a two-volume set? Just shout out an answer. Anybody? All right, the end, okay, that, that's question number two. But how do we know this is volume two? And you, asked, you, you answered it. The answer is in, the, the book was addressed. Open your books, Bibles to Acts chapter one. In Acts chapter one, verse one, and, and uh, John is right, it's, the, it's uh, addressed to the same author or the, to the same recipient. But in Acts chapter 1, the answer just kind of jumps out at you. The first account I composed. So he starts off saying, this is the first thing I did. Is I, I, I wrote, let's see, wait a minute, there we go. The, fir the first account, let me get back, up, back. Okay, there we go. I got to learn how to operate this. The first count, account I composed Theophilus. So it was addressed, as John said, to one author, but this refers to the first one. What does that tell us? It's the second one. It's the second of, two, of a two-volume set of uh, history, and what's it about? Notice again in the text, I don't have this on the screen, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. All right, and so then that begins to ask, brings us to the question, 
of how do we know what is the first book? And John answered that one. How do we know what's the first book? Well, that's Luke chapter 1. Turn over to Luke. Keep a marker there in Acts 1 and turn back to the book of Luke. In Luke chapter 1 and verses 1 through 4. Luke is writing there, recording why he's writing the book. He says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of these things, of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent, Theophilus. And so Acts 1, Theophilus, here Theophilus again, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. So Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke to confirm the message about Jesus for a man named Theophilus. And then he followed that up with a continuation of the work of Jesus. Go back to Acts chapter 1, notice what he said. The first account I composed Theophilus about all that Jesus began to do and teach. And so now he's going to continue what Jesus did and teach. But now in the, in the book of Acts, Jesus is going to do it through his apostles, through his authorized messengers and spokesmen. He's going to be doing the same work that way. Uh, that's Christ is going to be working that way. Again, first account refers back to Luke. Acts is the continuation of what he did in the book of Luke. Second question. Acts, or second basic principle. Acts has a simple outline in Acts 1, verse 8. Shout it out. What are, what's the simple outline? Anybody? What's the first part of the outline? There's going to be their witnesses where? All right, Jerusalem is the first one in Jerusalem. That's in chapter 1 and uh, verse uh, 8. Verse 8, I don't know why it's at verse 7. Or yeah, chapters 1 through 7, excuse me. Chapters 1 through 7 is in Jerusalem. So the, the primary place where all of this is taking place is in Jerusalem in Acts chapters 1 through 7. Second one L.R. mentioned was Judea and Samaria. And that's basically chapters 8 through 12 cover that sec section. And then into all the world or to all the earth in verses or chapters 13 through 18. Let's read verse 8, Acts 1, verse 8. He tells the apostles, You told them to wait, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. So they're going to be declaring this news about Jesus, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. So they're going to be taking the Lord's message to the entire world. So the, the work that Jesus began with his life on earth continued after his ascension to heaven through the apostles taking the message of salvation that Jesus came to bring to all the world. All right, so that's the second basic principle. There's a third basic principle. Acts follows a simple pattern of preaching. And once you kind of catch this and you start thinking about this, you'll find that it's amazing as you work your way through the book of Acts and you read sermon after sermon, preaching after preaching, teaching after teaching, all the way to the very end in, Acts, in chapter 28. And there is a consistent pattern to what they're preaching. They're saying the same thing over and over and over again. First thing they say is Jesus of Nazareth. They present Jesus of Nazareth. Look in Acts chapter 2 very quickly. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter begins speaking there in Acts 2, verse 22, well, he says, first of all, that these guys aren't drunk. This is the fulfillment of prophecy. Verse 22, men of Israel, listen to do these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. And so that's part number one. He's talking about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. That's why... In the very beginning of the book, he talks about how this is about what Jesus began to do and teach. Anybody want to guess what the second major point is? We just had a class over it as a hint. What's the second major? Resurrection. The resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. The death, burial, and resurrection. Notice back in Acts chapter 2, this man, verse 23... This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again. So the death, burial, and resurrection. 
This is going to be the pattern. You, just, you go to Acts 3, you go to Acts 4, you go just pull up the sermons, and you'll find this is the consistent pattern of teaching or preaching throughout the book of Acts. And so what it does is it helps us pull the book together and see that there is a, just a theme to this other than just a history of people going out and preaching. And we'll talk more about that as we continue. So that's a simple pattern. Second thing is the ascension. The ascension. And so he begins to talk about that uh, there here in verse 33. He says in Acts 2, Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, that's the ascension, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this. So he had received that promise of resurrection, and as a result of that now was pouring out the Spirit on the apostles. Let's go back to Acts chapter 1. I want us to notice this here even in, the book of, in, in Acts chapter 1. Go back to Acts chapter 1, look at verse 1. The first account I composed Theophilus about all what? That Jesus began to do and teach. So he starts the book with that first point, Jesus. It's about Jesus. And then verse 2 he says until the, he gives us the third point there about the ascension until the day when he was taken up into heaven after he would by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles. But verse 3 is this second part here? He kind of gets them a little bit of out, out of order because he's recapping what he did in Acts 2 or in the book of Luke. Verse 3 To these he also presented himself alive after suffering by many convincing proofs, for, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. And then verse 9 through 11 is the ascension, the, the account of the actual ascension into heaven. So you have these first three points here in Acts chapter 1. Now the fourth point is not so much here in Acts 1, but it shows up in Peter's sermon in Acts 2 and it shows up all throughout the New Testament or all throughout the rest of the book and that is you go out and you call people to believe and obey. That's your pattern. That is a simple pattern of preaching over and over again. You know, Matt and Jason did such a great job of showing us the uh, Stephen, I don't know why. I, I've been trying to call you Jason all quarter. <laughs> I keep telling us, Jason, my wife is saying, no, it's Stephen. It's Stephen. Okay. So J Stephen and, and Matthew did such a great job of talking about the resurrection. And then as you talk about that, you talk about the ascension. And as you talk about the ascension, you talk about what it means to us as individuals. It's not just news or information that we can chalk up. Hey, I can pass the test, I can answer these questions. The important part is, what are we going to do with it? What difference is it going to make in our lives? And that's, that's what he's trying to get us to understand here. And so that's the fourth part of it. So this is really the, the pattern. The basic principles acts as the second half of a two-book set. It has a simple outline in, uh, given to us in verse 8 of chapter 1. And there is a pattern to the preaching. Chapter 1 begins with the Lord telling them to wait in Jerusalem for power from the Holy Spirit, and then go preach. They were going to go preach that message. Chapter 1 ends with them picking a 12th man to replace Judas in order to fulfill the Lord's charge. And that man had to be a witness of Jesus. He had to have been there from the baptism to the ascension so that he could tell people about Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth. Who died, was buried, and raised back to life, and now reigns in heaven. That, that's the pattern. That, that's what Acts 2 is about. It's the history of people teaching and preaching that and others believing it and continuing the preaching and teaching of that. The pattern is consistent. Chapter 2, let's open your books and switch over to chapter 2. We've been in chapter 1. We've looked a little bit at chapter 2. Let's look at chapter 2 again. Jumps right into the coming of the Holy Spirit and Peter and the 11 preaching on the day of Pentecost. Chapters 3 through 27 just record them continuing to preach. And brings Paul into the mix and others. And chapter 28 ends with Paul under house arrest in Rome continuing to preach without any hesitation or interference. It's about preaching and it's about preaching the message of Jesus Christ. Now, let's step back and ask the question. We've got the outline. Let's step back and ask the question. How did we get here? How did we get here? The first question is, how did you get here as a believer in Jesus Christ? Worshiping with the saints who make up the West End Church of Christ. 
Now, without getting into personal details of who, what, when, and where, but how? How did you get to be here as a believer? How did you become a believer? And there's a simple answer to it that's I've hinted at as we've been working our way through that. You heard the word and believed. Thank you. Exactly. The word was preached. Somebody cared enough about us to teach us the gospel of Jesus Christ. It may have been our parents. It may have been our grandparents. It may have been friends. It may have been future spouses in some cases. But somebody cared about us enough to tell us about Jesus Christ, to, to, to teach us the message about the Lord. That is the undeniable common factor to every conversion. And that, that's important for us to understand. It, it's not something miraculous or not something unique or different. I mean, everybody's situation is unique because everyone is unique. But in, in the end, it all comes down to the fact that somebody sat down with you and told you that there was a man named Jesus who died, buried, and was buried and resurrected from the grave, who ascended to heaven where he reigns now on the throne next to the Father in heaven. And you need to believe it and obey it. It's no more complicated than that. That is the consistent pattern. That, that's really what happens to all of us. And here's where I want to pull one theme throughout all of this, and I've been touching on it over and over again, and that is preaching the Word of God. When you work your way through the book of Acts, and I would recommend that you do this, sit down and go through the first 14 chapters, since we are covering that in this review, and then Mike's going to pick up with chapter 15 on Wednesday night, so you want to read in advance to that, prepare for that. And make a note or circle every time the, there is a discussion of what is said, taught, heard. And you'll find that the theme throughout the entire first 14 chapters and throughout the entire 28 chapters of the book is preaching. It's preaching and teaching the Word of God. Why do you think West End spends so much time with Bible classes and with preaching instead of other things? Donna, what do you think? Can you explain to that what that is about? Exactly. We have to do that to teach, teach the Word. Mold the minds of these young people. Mold the minds of the young people, excellent. And teach the Word. We're, and and to, to reshape and reform and strengthen the minds of us old people. That's what it's all about. And, and it's important to understand because you work your way through there and there's, there's a tendency, and the reason I'm emphasizing this is there's a tendency from time to time to get all hung up on the Holy Spirit. and Well, maybe the Holy Spirit's doing something. Maybe the Holy Spirit's acting something. And the Holy Spirit is all throughout the book of Acts as well. But there's no comparison between the description and references to the Holy Spirit, uh, Spirit's action and the preaching of the Word of God. It's not even close. How many of you have ever saw the movie Secretariat? Okay, you saw the movie? All right, if you recall, there, there was a, a discussion, that, you know, there was always back and forth about whether or not he would win the races and the competitor, uh, competitors were always trying to talk it down. And in that last race, the Belmont, which is a mile and a half, which is the longest race by a quarter of a mile, the competitors said, convinced themselves that Secretariat could not hold up over that long mile and a half that he would fade down the home stretch. And when the race started, he began pulling away very quickly and down the back stretch just started leaving him in the dust. And, and even his owners were getting a little bit worried, thinking, oh, what's he doing? What's, the, what's this jockey doing? He's going to wear him out. He's going to get tired. And the competitors were, were excited, saying, oh, he's going, to, he's going to fade. He's going to get down there and he's just going to be exhausted and not be able to finish the race, and we're just going to pass him, and one of us will get a chance to win. Well, if you watch the movie, and if you've ever seen photos of it, when the, the, the photos of Secretariat show him crossing the finish line, you don't, you don't see any other horse anywhere. And in the movie, they show how far behind the other horses were. They were barely coming around the fourth corner, and he's still gaining on them. He's still leaving, getting further ahead when he crosses the finish line. 27 lengths. That's a long way to win a race. Well, the reason I'm pointing that out is when you talk about what God does in the lives of people today and how he works in the lives of people today, the word of God is like secretariat. 
it blows everything else away. It is, the, it is the, the beast that is charging and, and pulling everything together and pulling everything along. He is, it is what leads us to Christ. It is what leads anybody and everybody to Christ. That's why the question, you heard the word and believed. That's the answer to the question. Because that word is the power of God in the conversion of people. God's word, the action of God's word in converting people to Christ dominates the book of Acts. Dominates it. And this is why it would be good for you to go through and just kind of mark that in your text. Don't be afraid to write in your Bible. Make notes in it. You can get another one if you wear it out. All right, just make notes in it. Don't be afraid to do that. I want you to look at some passages. Let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 14. After the, power, the Holy Spirit came with power, and it did something to the apostles, gave them the ability to do something. And notice what it starts off with in verse 14. Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them. So it starts off immediately with Paul, Peter now standing up and telling them words, giving them information about what was going on. So that's the first thing. Give heed to my words. He tells them, listen to what I have to say. In fact, he says, men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. All right. Now he continues. Verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Again, it just continues. This is going to be throughout and, and I, we could just spend the entire class just reading these passages. And we don't have time to do that. I don't want to do that to you. But here we're in chapter 2, and this is the day of Pentecost. And the first thing you see is Peter preaching and telling people, listen to what he is saying. He goes on, verse 31. Verse 31 says this, uh, sim something very similar. He looked ahead, and talking about David as a prophet, looking ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ. All right, so the prophecy was God speaking through his prophets, revealing a message. All right, so that was there. And then he continues on in verse 31 again. Uh, he looked ahead and spoke in verse 37. Now when they heard this, so after they heard, you kill, this, this Jesus that you cried, God uh, killed, God raised him from the dead, raised him to the throne of God in heaven, and now he sits as Lord God in heaven with the Father as Lord and Christ, and that's when they heard this, verse 37, they were pierced to the heart. So the words got their attention. The message converted, cut them to the heart. Right. And that's just in chapter 2. He continues on. Verse 40. Verse 40 says the same thing again. With many other words he solemnly testified. Then in verse 41, so then those who had received his word were baptized. See a pattern? Not only is there the pattern of the message, but there's the pattern just of preaching itself. Preaching is the pattern. The deliverance of words is the pattern. And it's important to see this so that we don't get distracted by people trying to say, well, there must be something more. There needs to be something more. The world's going to try to tell you that, that there's something else besides the Word of God, that the Word's dead. You need the Holy Spirit to live in you. No, the Word of God is how God works in people's hearts. And this helps us understand Romans 10, 17. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of the Lord, or Word of Christ, or Word of God, if you're in the King James Version. This passage, and I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hand and make a confession but how many of you, when you hear that quoted, sometimes just kind of tune it out? Yeah, Romans 10, 17. Yeah, everybody knows that. Everybody knows faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. But I'm telling you, Paul in Romans 10, 17 is capturing the book of Acts in one statement. People preach the Word of God. And in fact, that you read chapter 10, it's all about that. The Word is preached. People hear it, and they believe unto the saving of their souls. There's just a tendency sometimes to get a little tired of that. And I'll confess, I, I've done that sometimes. You hear a preacher quote Romans 10, 17, and I'm just 
man, I've heard that a bazillion times in my life. But, you know, all of a sudden one day it dawned on me, there's a reason we need to hear that a bazillion times. Because that's how it works. No other way. No other way except by hearing the Word of Christ. You want to be saved? You want to convince someone to be saved? you got to make sure they hear the Word, the Word of God. And, by that, and when they hear that, if they will believe it, they can be saved if they will obey the Lord. So that's just Acts chapter 2. In fact, in verse, let's go back to, let's look quickly at this in, in chapter 2, verse 38. Verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent, each one of you, or each of you be, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Notice something that, that whether you think that the gift is the Holy Spirit himself or the salvation that was promised in Joel chapter 2 that's recorded here in verse 21 of Acts chapter 2, it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Whichever you believe is the gift that's being promised here, being spoken of by Peter, notice when it comes. When does it come? Anybody, shout it out. After what? Hearing. After hearing the word, believing it, repenting, and being baptized. So you see how the message of the word of God comes first in the conversion process. Well, actually the deliverance of it, that's, that's in the past. So with respect to us, it's the hearing, believing, and obeying that comes first before anything else can happen. All right, so that's Acts chapter 2. Now, it continues. It just keeps going on in the text. Let's look at chapter 3. We'll go through chapter 3 very quickly. Chapter 3 is kind of the same thing. Look in verse 12. And so Peter actually works a miracle, heals the lame man, and then everybody's gathering around to see what's going on. And verse 12, when Peter saw this, he replied to the people. So now he's starting to speak. They saw the miracle. Now he's delivering a message to them. He continues that in verse 21. And it was God, he, saying that God spoke through the mouth of his prophets. In verse 21. Verse 22 says, Moses, the Lord God, Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. So the prophet, he's saying, is Jesus, and what we need to do is listen to what Jesus says, what God's prophet says. And verse 23, it shall be that every soul that does not heed, another translation of heed is listen and obey, heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announced these days. So you see the pattern continues. Chapter 2, you have the day of Pentecost, preaching, hearing, believing, obeying. Acts chapter 3, you hear, have preaching, hearing, believing, and obeying. And so this pattern continues on. In chapter 4, because there's such an uproar about this miracle, they get arrested. Chapter 4 shows that as they were speaking, verse 1, to the people, the priests, and the captain of the temple guard, and the Sadducees came up to them, and notice what they're upset about. Not about the miracle. Verse 2, and being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. You see the pattern continues all through the book of Acts. It just continues. And verse 4, 16 through 20, they're arrested and they're arguing with the men there. And they told him basically, we told you not to talk about this guy. And here you are filling Jerusalem with the word about this guy, so we want you to speak no longer to any man in this name. And they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Verse 18, verse 20, Paul, uh, Peter answers, We cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Speaking. Now, I'm, I'm not kind of beating this horse here, but it's important for us to understand. To see this to work our way through the book of Acts, to see this is about God delivering a message, and we are to hear that message, believe it and obey it, and then our job is going to be sharing that message here in the congregational level, in Bible classes, and in the sermons, but also us individually out in the world with our children, with our family, with our friends, acquaintances, sharing that word, because it is the power of God and the salvation. Chapter 6, 
Or chapter 5, it's the same thing. We could go through and read that. Chapter 5, they're arrested again because they're continuing to fill the city of Jerusalem with the teaching about Jesus, and the priests are just infuriated at that, and they're doing everything they can to shut them down. And in fact, this time they were intending to kill them, but who stood up and stopped that? Anybody remember who stopped it? Gamaliel, Gamaliel, the, uh, the, the, Sad, uh, the Pharisee, the Sadducees wanted to kill him. The Pharisee stood up and said, let's not do this. But again, what did he tell them to do at the end? Verse 28, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring his head, uh, his blood, this man's blood upon us. And verse 40, they beat them, they flogged them, and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus. So this is the first time there's a record of the apostles getting beaten. They weren't killed, but they were beaten for, not, for continuing to teach and told not to teach. But what does it say they do at the end of the chapter, verse 42? What they keep on doing? They kept on teaching. They kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So the first five chapters, all throughout, we have Pentecost, we have chapter 3, you have the, and that's in Acts chapter 2, chapter 3, you have the healing of the lame man and the preaching. In chapter 4, you have them arrested because of their teaching. Chapter 5, they're arrested again because of their teaching, and they continue to teach. Now in chapter 6, again, we're trying to cover this question, chapter 6, it's the same thing. You have the event where there is uh, some disruption in the church because the Grecian widows were being neglected. And the apostles said, we need to appoint somebody to take care of this because we cannot stop ourselves from... Our main job is the ministry of the Word in verse 4. And notice in verse 7 in chapter 6, verse 7, what keeps growing? No? What's the first thing he says in verse 7? The Word of God kept spreading. The church grew as a result of that. We'll talk about that in a moment. But then, and the number of disciples continued to increase. But it's because of the spreading of the Word. On and on this continues. Chapter 6. Chapter 7 is Stephen. Stephen is going and is uh, arrested because of the fact that he was working miracles. Or what, why was Stephen arrested and put on trial and then ultimately killed? Because he worked miracles or because he did something else. What was he doing that got him arrested and killed? Preaching. Teaching. Chapter 6 is about him doing that. Chapter 7 is the trial, and he preaches one of the longest sermons recorded in the book of Acts. Uh, recording and basically saying, you people are continuing the practice of your ancestors of not listening to God. Not listening to the preaching. So it continues on and on. Every, then in chapter 8 you have Paul starting the persecution of the church. And now you break out of, you break out of, that, uh, that, uh, out of Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria. And what happens in verse, in verse 4 of chapter 8? What are they doing? What do these scattered believers do everywhere they go? Preach. Preach. I don't think, all right, so that, everybody kind of gets the idea now. Preach. They preach, they preach, they preach. Chapter 8, they're spreading. Philip, one of the seven that was selected in chapter 6, goes and preaches in Samaria. And he's preaching the word in Samaria. That continues and there in chapter 8. Over and over again, this word of God continues to be preached. Apostles heard about it. They came up. And we have some um, further evidence here. They, they laid their hands on Stephen, which is why he was able to work miracles. Chapter 8, they come up to Samaria, they lay their hands on some of the believers there, and they're able to work miracles. And, but the main event, the main thing that's going on is preaching. All right. So let's, let's continue. I want to go through this very quickly. Chapter 12, uh, chapters 10 and 11, chapters 10 and 11 are the conversion of Saul in uh, chapter 9, chapters 10. You have the conversion of the Gentiles when uh, Peter goes to the house of Cornelius. And he teaches the word there. In fact, I want you to notice one verse here in chapter 11. When Peter gets back to Jerusalem, and a couple of verses here in chapter 11, when Peter gets back to Jerusalem, he has to explain why he went into Gentiles, because that's just not acceptable. And he told them about the vision, and he told them about what he had heard. In verse 14, 
Paul, uh, Peter talks about what Cornelius said. The angel told Cornelius that when Peter comes, he will, verse 14, he will speak words to you by which you will be saved in all your household. And so then he said, they heard it, they believed it, the Holy Spirit was given so that, the, that Peter and the Jews would accept the fact that these people could hear and believe and obey the gospel. They weren't given the Holy Spirit. Cornelius didn't receive the Holy Spirit to be saved. He received it so that Peter and the Jews would accept them as Christians, believe that they could obey the gospel. They had the same gospel. So that's chapter 9. Now, 10 and 11, chapter 12, is the death chapter where James is killed. The brother of John is killed. Peter's thrown in jail, but he gets out. But I want you to notice again in verse 24. This is, if you want to find this verse, this verse is, or a version of this verse is throughout the new, uh, book of Acts as well. Verse 24. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and be multiplied. All right, chapter 13 and 14 are the first preaching tour. And then let's skip to Acts 28. I want to skip to Acts 28. Because this is a, yeah, I'm just kind of working this over, but this is important to see how this works. At the end, verse 30 and 31, talking about Paul in Rome, says he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and, and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness and unhindered. And so what that's telling us, brethren, is that Acts is a call for us to continue this pattern. It didn't stop and say, well, it's all done, it's all wrapped up. This pattern of preaching and teaching the four things that we talked about at the beginning is our work today. It's not something that for Mike to do or the elders to do or the teachers to do. It's something for us to do. Because we need to be sharing this word, teaching others about Jesus Christ. It's a call for us to continue the work in our generation. All right. About to run out of time. Very quickly, question number two. How did West End Church of Christ come into existence? In 1959, a group of believers decided that they needed another congregation, a faithful congregation on the west side of town. So they came out of 12th Street. It's friendly, friendly swarm. And it was a desire to go out there. In 1959, transportation was not like it is today. You know, we had, people had cars, but you, know, you didn't just zip by everywhere. and zip, you know, it, it took longer. And so having a congregation out there, may, a meeting out there, was, made a good sense. And, of course, now, a few years later, you end up here. In fact, I know David Lanfair, he's not in class, was one of the, he was a kid when that happened. Anybody in here? That was a kid. Mike, what, you, you were? Mark, you, you were a part of that? Yeah. Wow. All right, so how old? Well, I want to ask how old you were. But you were a kid. You were like two, one, two. All right. Oh, six, okay. So it's been a few years. And this congregation will continue to be here. Think about what that this congregation that will keep it here is with the elders making sure that the Word of God is taught, that we continue to build ourselves on the rock of Jesus Christ and that we continue to build ourselves on the teaching, on the Word. Jude 3, these are some passages you can mark down about how this process continues. Whether we stay here or move to even a bigger building, time will only tell, only time can tell. But this is how it will take place. This is how this church will be here in another 60 years, maintaining this tie to the Scripture. And then the third question, and we'll be done very quickly. Third question. How did the Lord's church come into existence? Well, it wasn't an apostolic succession. It wasn't a church succession. It's a word succession. Power is in the gospel. You want to continue the church, the Lord's church, for another 60 years? Stick to the word. Stick to the teaching. All right, Mike will pick us up with chapter 15 on Wednesday night. Thank you.